this is a flaw of the great climate models we have at the moment. They all imply that if you could reduce the carbon dioxide, bring it back, stabilise it at some level, all would be well. We could handle the situation. I think this is nonsense. So 55 million years ago, when about the same amount of carbon dioxide went into the atmosphere as we are putting in, and it jumped five degrees quite suddenly, well, it took 200,000 years for it to go back. I think one of the crucial bits of the system, which everyone knows of change, is the floating ice in the Arctic Ocean. As you probably know, last summer, 60% of it went, and they think that in not many years, perhaps little as five, perhaps as much as 15, it'll all be gone. When it does, you can work out in the back of an envelope what difference this makes to the heat load of the Earth, and you'll find it's about equal to all of the CO2 we've added to the atmosphere to date. In other words, heating doubles when, uh, by the time that ice goes. Do you think there's any going back? Can we put that ice back? No, no way. In as little as 30 years' time, humankind could be in the grip of a global catastrophe caused by global warming. That's the view of the free-thinking scientist James Lovelock. He says the human population could fall to anything between a hundred million and a billion. Mr. Lovelock is the founder of the Gaia theory that the Earth exists as a single organism and regulates itself. Don't forget the IPCC is the United Nations body and it is to quite an extent political and I think quite a bit of pressure would be put on the IPCC not to say the kind of things I say. There's nothing we can do in, to reverse what's happened so far. If everybody could get together around the world and get farmers everywhere to convert their wastes to char, that's charcoal, and b either bury it in the soil or drop it in the sea, that might make quite a difference. But we're awful slow to act. Consider Kyoto was 12 years ago, and not a lot has been done about uh, global heating since then. No, no, indeed it hasn't. I think the only way to really solve our climate problem is to work in with Gaia, not against it. So how does the, the system, the whole Gaian system, take carbon dioxide out of the air? Because it takes as much out as it generates, in namely 550,000 million tonnes a year. How do we increase that by just a small amount so that then what we put in will be neutralised? It's not very difficult to do, actually. You take the waste uh, of all of the things that have grown, turn all of that waste, agricultural waste and other waste, into charcoal. It's almost chemically inert. It's almost like gold. If it's buried in the ground, it stays there virtually forever. You can dig up charcoal that's 300 million years old, that was buried when forest fires occurred, uh, in the world 300 million years ago. So it's pretty long-lived stuff. So if you take that carbon and bury it in the soil, then it's taken out of the system altogether. So that's a way, if you can do it, of balancing the books and putting the carbon story back on track. Well, Gaia theory says that the Earth is cool, moist, and with an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and with CO2 pumped down to almost a trace gas of only a few hundred parts per million, despite a too hot sun, because the presence of life keeps it this way. Quite simply, the evolution of life and its environment as a single entity have provided an atmosphere that's just right in composition for sustaining a habitable planet thinking blindly that simply reducing our carbon footprint is all we have to do. It isn't. We have to understand that by abrading the skin of our planet to provide farmland, we've destroyed more than 40% of the Earth's natural ecosystem. And these were what previously served to sustain a stable climate. And so we imposed our system of agriculture, which had arisen out of the Fertile Crescent and was involving plows and irrigation and hybrid seeds and uh, traditional ways of doing row cropping. Everywhere that, that that had been practiced for 
5,000 years had turned into a desert. Look at the Fertile Crescent today. Uh, look at Northern Africa. Look at the uh, area in the north of China. You go back thousands of years there of irrigation, the plow, uh, and the kinds of agriculture that were practiced, and you find that those destroy soils over the long term. They destroy the life, the soil food web. And so what happens is you end up with sterile deserts instead of fertile soils. I was born on a farm that my great-grandfather carved out of virgin prairie. When he plowed that land, it had about 100 tons of carbon per hectare in the ground. By the 1930s, that had diminished greatly. Then tractors came in, oil was 10 cents a barrel. They plowed deeper and took even more carbon out of the ground. And after the war, nitrate fertilizers pretty much knocked the last bit of stuffing out of the soil and it's now about five tons per hectare. So if you'd looked at that land on a Google map in 1885, it would have been black. Now if you look at it, it's a sort of pale beige color. It's, it's got no carbon left in it. Where did that carbon go? Into the atmosphere. And without carbon to hold soil together, without it to retain moisture in the soil, the soil disintegrated. Dust bowl, huge storms of dust, year after year, smothered the United States. Agriculture has problems. We're losing hundreds of millions of acres of land a year that is desalinated from overuse of chemicals or is just eroded and blown away. If the whole world went organic, we could sequester six gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Can we do better than that? And the argument of biochar is, yes, we can. This is biochar, basically homemade charcoal. You throw organic matter into an oven and burn it. But the secret is to not let much oxygen in, so you're really baking it. The result is a substance that works like magic on plants. Just pure biochar has better results in uh, North Carolina crops than commercial fertilizer. Not only does it make plants grow bigger, but it decays very slowly. So the carbon that's in here, if you put it into the soil, will stay there for over a thousand years. So biochar is nature's carbon capture machine. Biochar is a really crucial technology because it actually pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and deposits it in the soil where we really need it where it enhances the soil's fertility um, and it sequesters carbon in the soil. Biochar works like a sponge by trapping nutrients in water to give plants more time to absorb them. That's especially beneficial for eastern North Carolina's sandy soils. Valentine says if they can make a dependable machine, soldiers can export biochar ovens across the globe. We can put a farm in a container and take it to Iraq or Afghanistan and you would have a one acre farm coming in in a container. Improving poor soil, reducing carbon in the atmosphere, developing new farms overseas. It's ancient wisdom as far as I'm concerned. Scrap wood from the farm's lumber operation that would have just decomposed, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, is instead being smoldered at high temperature, leaving mostly pure carbon. Biochar makers liken it to a house for valuable microorganisms. And this is a basically a 50-50 mix of biochar and compost. Bob Wells says the carbon compost mix makes for such fertile soil it's transformed his vegetable farm on Cape Cod. All right, you start loading this. At Shelburne Farms, they think the porous black carbon chunks will work well as filters placed in streams to capture E. coli bacteria and phosphorus, preventing the pollutants from traveling from barns in stormwater runoff into Lake Champlain. It's better than black gold, says farmer Bob Wells. This is more like plastic. Yes. Project leaders admit it could take years or decades for biochar to catch on, but they point out composting and recycling were once received as new concepts too. I'm, I'm Paul Taylor. I'm actually a physicist. 
uh, in fact an astrophysicist. I was designing payloads for the space shuttle in the United States where I worked for 40 years. But I quickly realized that we were at the point now where we, we didn't any, only need to stop emissions, we really need to look after our land. And we needed to uh, strengthen it so it would not start to release carbon and we need to pull the carbon back down into the soils. And what biochar is about is that um, you take waste material and waste material is all over the place, waste biomass, waste stuff that was once living. Lots of agricultural residues, for example, in the sugar industry, we burn the stuff. So take that material and put it through a process, not of combustion, but of pyrolysis. And pyrolysis means to break down under heat. That's a, that's a piece of bamboo that has been uh, uh, carbonized. And if I squeezed that, it would just crush out. And then you have solid product coming out, which is just charcoal. It's char. It's the same stuff, more or less, that you would burn in your bar barbecue, but we don't want to burn it. We want to crush it up, we want to condition it, and put it into the soil. Charcoal is long-lasting. Because it lasts so long, one of the things it's done is it's sequestered or captured carbon into the soil. The second thing it does is it kind of acts like a coral reef for microorganisms like a barrier reef in terms of diversity of microorganisms on a miniature scale in the soil and the microorganisms are fundamental to most plants for their health and their nutritional quality and their growth. Take waste material, turn it into a valuable end product, put it into the soil, grow better food and help with climate as well. Charcoal is very lightweight because it's empty, hollow inside and it's like a sponge and like a sponge at your kitchen sink it soaks up water. So it helps the soil to absorb water when there's too much. Charcoal, because it's hollow inside, it used to be occupied by plant cells. Now it's empty because you cooked it. But now the microorganisms in the soil can move in and live in that, all that empty space. They got water, they have nutrients. It's their homes in the soil. Slash and burn farming is used by millions of people worldwide. Almost 400,000 hectares of forest go up in smoke each year. The technique is damaging for the forest, while with the gases given off by burning, aggravates climate change. Slash and burn cultivation also affects the soil. After a few harvests, yields begin to fall, sometimes by more than 50%. The farmer then has to move on, often many kilometers from home, to cut and clear new areas of land. A year ago, a project that is unique in the equatorial forest was launched here in Pimu. The inexpensive technique uses organic carbon, known as biochar, which is made using decomposing vegetable matter and crop remains. The mixture is then put in an Adam's oven, named after its inventor, and the resulting biochar is buried in the soil. The land is fertilized and revitalized, but that isn't the only argument in its favor. Since its launch in 2010, a hundred or so farmers have participated. Decomposing vegetable matter ejects CO2 into the atmosphere. Biochar converts it into carbon that it traps in the soil, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Until the project is widely adopted, hectares of forests will keep going up in smoke and food security for farmers will remain unpredictable. The stakes are high, but if the biochar project proves financially viable, it could soon be applied to the entire rainforest and even the continent. This is Eric Knight from Echo Technologies Group, a pioneer within the field of biochar, and we wanted to ask you a few quick questions. So first of all, uh, for the people who don't know anything, what is biochar? Well, it's a <coughs> way to a newer soil amendment that's unlike any other because it doesn't go away. It stays in the soil, it's an infrastructure providing a home for the microbes and the soil food web. The mycorrhizal fungi and the microbes find a purchase and microbes like to sit down when they eat and then they can truly attack the minerals in the soil. And the fungus is an interstate highway that carries moisture and carries the nutrients to the plant roots, the symbiotic relationship. And not only that, it's the internet of plant chemical communication. It's not just feeding the plant, it's feeding the soil, but it's beyond that. It's providing 
uh, hydroxyl alcohols in the mini bar. It's carbolic fat in the in, in, in the pantry. It's the utilities for free. As a child, I lived in Africa, um, and there's a passionate provider. A woman, I mean, and the women do all this work. Ten miles to get to to deforest. Napoli can take dung, grasses, and biochar, small pyrolytic stoves. Their children don't don't get rest, don't get uh, black lung. They don't get emphysema. The the, the you know the kids don't die. Food security. That's a small scale. Now on the big scale, on the industrial Western scale, it it saves us it, we, we, from soil mining ourselves in the rat race of NPK. If we can marry organic practice with industrial agricultural practice, we could be a first civilization that could maintain fertility for a millennium and beyond. All farmers, whether they believe in global warming or not, know in their heart that building soil carbon is good for them, their bottom line, and their kids. They don't need to believe in global warming because they know it's a nonpartisan issue. Almost nothing grows in the super salty soil of Qatar's western desert except for here. Just a meter below the surface, the groundwater is saltier than the sea. But on top, trees flourish, animal forage and vegetables bloom. Researchers took a naturally occurring soil fungus called mycorrhiza. They mass produced it in a lab and then introduced it to the farm soil. It attaches itself to the roots of plants, helping them absorb water and minerals much more efficiently. The fungus growing on the roots of these plants mean they need 25% less water. This means they can survive in the very salty conditions here in Qatar. It also means they survive the summer heat, often above 50 degrees Celsius. If that's not all, the fungus also works to improve soil quality and reduces the need for fertilizer. Both human food and animal fodder have flourished. Wheat, corn, radishes and tomatoes all growing well with the help of the root fungus. Lab testing found the food was as nutritious as that grown on more arable land. The technique is cheap and researchers say it has huge potential, not just for Qatar, but also for the many other countries facing similar challenges. As climate change puts more and more pressure on food production, anything that helps countries adapt will be in high demand. Bringing poor quality land into cultivation may well be the only way to feed the next generation.